Chapter 15, The Forbidden Forest. Things couldn't have been worse. Filch took them down to Professor McGonagall's study on the first floor, where they sat and waited without saying a word to each other. Hermione was trembling. Excuses, alibis, and wild cover-up stories chased each other around Harry's brain, each more feeble than the last. He couldn't see how they were going to get out of trouble this time. They were cornered. How could they have been so stupid as to forget the cloak? There was no reason on earth that Professor McGonagall would accept for their being out of bed and creeping around the school in the dead of night, let alone being up the tallest astronomy tower, which was out of bounds except for classes. Add Norbert and the invisibility cloak, and they might as well be packing their bags already. Had Harry thought that things couldn't have been worse? He was wrong. When Professor McGonagall appeared, she was leading Neville. Harry! Neville burst out the moment he saw the other two. I was trying to find you and warn you. I heard Malfoy saying he was going to catch you. He said you had a drag. Harry shook his head violently to shut Neville up before Professor McGonagall had seen. She looked more likely to breathe fire than Norbert as she towered over the three of them. I would never have believed it of any of you. Mr. Filch says you were up in the astronomy tower. It's one o'clock in the morning. Explain yourselves. It was the first time Hermione had ever failed to answer a teacher's question. She was staring at her slippers, as still as a statue. I think I've got a good idea of what's been going on, said Professor McGonagall. It doesn't take a genius to work it out. You fed Draco Malfoy some cock and bull story about a dragon trying to get him out of bed and into trouble. I've already caught him. I suppose you think it's funny that Longbottom here heard the story and believed it too? Harry caught Neville's eye and tried to tell him without words that this wasn't true, because Neville was looking stunned and hurt. Poor, blundering Neville. Harry knew what it must have cost him to try and find them in the dark, to warn them. I'm disgusted, said Professor McGonagall. Four students out of bed in one night. I've never heard of such a thing before. You, Miss Granger, I thought you had more sense. As for you, Mr. Potter, I thought Gryffindor meant more to you than this. All three of you will receive detentions. Yes, you too, Mr. Longbottom. Nothing gives you the right to walk around school at night, especially these days. It's very dangerous. And 50 points will be taken from Gryffindor. 50? Harry gasped. They would lose the lead, the lead he'd won in the last Quidditch match. 50 points each, said Professor McGonagall, breathing heavily through her long, pointed nose. Professor, please... You can't! Don't tell me what I can and can't do, Potter. Now get back to bed, all of you. I've never been more ashamed of Gryffindor students. A hundred and fifty points lost. That put Gryffindor in last place. In one night, they'd ruined any chance Gryffindor had had for the House Cup. Harry felt as though the bottom had dropped out of his stomach. How could they ever make up for this? Harry didn't sleep all night. He could hear Neville sobbing into his pillow for what seemed like hours. Harry couldn't think of anything to say to comfort him. He knew Neville, like himself, was dreading the dawn. What would happen when the rest of Gryffindor found out what they'd done? At first, Gryffindor's passing the giant hourglasses that recorded the house points the next day thought there'd been a mistake. How could they suddenly have a hundred and fifty points fewer than yesterday? And then the story started to spread. Harry Potter the famous Harry Potter, their hero of two Quidditch matches, had lost them all those points, him and a couple other stupid first years. From being one of the most popular and admired people at the school, Harry was suddenly the most hated. Even Ravenclaws and Hufflepuffs turned on him because everyone had been longing to see Slytherin lose the House Cup. Everywhere Harry went, people pointed and didn't trouble to lower their voices as they insulted him. Slytherins, on the other hand, clapped as he walked past them, whistling and cheering. Thanks, Potter, we owe you one! Only Ron stood by him. They'll all forget in a few weeks. Fred and George have lost loads of points in all the time they've been here, and people still like them. They've never lost 150 points in one go, though, have they? Said Harry, miserably. Well, no, Ron admitted. It was a bit late to repair the damage, but Harry swore to himself not to meddle in things that weren't his business from now on. He'd had it with sneaking around and spying. 
He felt so ashamed of himself that he went to Wood and offered to resign from the Quidditch team. Resign? Wood thundered. What good will that do? How are we going to get any points back if we can't win at Quidditch? But even Quidditch had lost its fun. The rest of the team wouldn't speak to Harry during practice, and if they had to speak about him, they called him the Seeker. Hermione and Neville are suffering, too. They didn't have as bad a time as Harry because they weren't as well known, but nobody would speak to them either. Hermione had stopped drawing attention to herself in class, keeping her head down and working in silence. Harry was almost glad that the exams weren't far away. All the studying he had to do to keep his mi kept his mind off his misery. He, Ron, and Hermione kept to themselves, working late into the night, trying to remember the ingredients in complicated potions, learn charms and spells by heart, memorize the dates of magical discoveries and goblin rebellions. Then about a week before the exams were due to start, Harry's new resolution not to interfere in anything that didn't concern him was put to an unexpected test. Walking back from the library on his own one afternoon, he heard somebody whimpering from a classroom up ahead. As he drew closer, he heard Quirrell's voice. No! No! Not again, please! It sounded as though someone was threatening him. Harry moved closer. All right! All right! He heard Quirrell sob. Next second, Quirrell came hurrying out of the classroom, straightening his turban. He was pale and looked as though he was about to cry. He strode out of sight. Harry didn't think Quirrell had even noticed him. He waited until Quirrell's footsteps had disappeared, then peered into the classroom. It was empty, but a door stood ajar at the other end. Harry was halfway toward it before he remembered what he'd promised himself about not meddling. All the same, he'd have gambled twelve sorcerer stones that Snape had just left the room, and from what Harry had just heard, Snape would be walking with a new spring in his step. Quirrell seemed to have given in at last. Harry went back to the library, where Hermione was testing Ron on astronomy. Harry told them what he'd heard. Snape's done it, then, said Ron. If Quirrell's told him how to break his anti-dark force spell... They're still fluffy, though, said Hermione. Maybe Snape's found out how to get past him without asking Hagrid, said Ron, looking up at the thousands of books surrounding them. I bet there's a book somewhere in here telling you how to get past a giant three-headed dog. So what do we do, Harry? The light of adventure was kindling again in Ron's eyes, but Hermione answered before Harry could. Go to Dumbledore. That's what we should have done ages ago. If we try anything ourselves, we'll be thrown out for sure. But we've got no proof, said Harry. Quirrell's too scared to back us up. Snape's only got to say he doesn't know how the troll got in at Halloween, and that he was nowhere near the third floor. Who do you think they'll believe? Him or us? It's not exactly a secret we hate him. Dumbledore will think we made it up to get him sacked. Filch wouldn't help us if his life depended on it. He's too friendly with Snape. And the more students get thrown out, the better he'll think. And don't forget, we're not supposed to know about the stone or Fluffy. That'll take a lot of explaining. Hermione looked convinced, but Ron didn't. If we just do a bit of poking around? No, said Harry flatly. We've done enough poking around. He pulled a map of Jupiter toward him and started to learn the names of its moons. The following morning, notes were delivered to Harry, Hermione, and Neville at the breakfast table. They were all the same. Your detention will take place at 11 o'clock tonight. Meet Mr. Filch in the entrance hall, Professor M. McGonagall. Harry had forgotten they still had detentions to do in the furor over the points they'd lost. He half expected Hermione to complain that this was a whole night of studying lost, but she didn't say a word. Like Harry, she felt they deserved what they got. At 11 o'clock that night, they said goodbye to Ron in the common room and went down to the entrance hall with Neville. Filch was already there, and so was Malfoy. Harry had also forgotten that Malfoy had gotten a detention, too. Follow me, said Filch, lighting a lamp and leading them outside. I bet you'll think twice about breaking a school rule again, won't you, eh? He said, leering at him. Oh, yes. Hard work and pain are the best teachers, if you ask me. It's just a pity they let the old punishments die out. Hang you by your wrists from the ceiling for a few days. I've got the chains still in my office. Keep them well oiled in case they're ever needed. Right. Off we go. And don't think of running off now. It'll be worse for you if you do. They marched off across the dark grounds. Neville kept sniffing. Harry wondered what their punishment was going to be. It must be something really horrible or Filch wouldn't be sounding so delighted. The moon was bright, 
but clouds scuttling across it kept throwing them into darkness. Ahead, Harry could see the lighted windows of Hagrid's hut. Then they heard a distant shout. Is that you, Filch? Hurry up. I want to get started. Harry's heart rose. If they were going to be working with Hagrid, it wouldn't be so bad. His relief must have shown on his face because Filch said, I hope you think you'll be enjoy I suppose you think you'll be enjoying yourself with that oaf. Well, think again, boy. It's into the forest you're going, and I'm much mistaken if you'll come out in one piece. At this, Neville let out a little moan, and Malfoy stopped dead in his tracks. The forest, he repeated, and he didn't sound quite as cool as usual. We can't go in there at night. There's all sorts of things in there. Werewolves, I heard. Neville clutched the sleeve of Harry's robe and made a choking noise. That's your problem, isn't it? said Filch, his voice cack cracking with glee. Should have thought of them werewolves before you got in trouble, shouldn't ya? Hagrid came striding toward them out of the dark, fang at his heel. He was carrying his large crossbow, and a quiver of arrows hung over his shoulder. About time, he said. I've been waiting for half an hour already, all right. Harry, Hermione. I shouldn't be too friendly to them, Hagrid, said Filch coldly. They're here to be punished, after all. That's why you're late, is it? said Hagrid, frowning at Filch. Been lecturing them, huh? It's not your place to do that. You've done your bit. I'll take over from here. I'll be back at dawn, said Filch, for what's left of them, he added nastily, and he turned and started back toward the castle, his lamp bobbing away in the darkness. Malfoy now turned to Hagrid. I'm not going in that forest, he said, and Harry was pleased to hear the note of panic in his voice. <laughs> you are if you want to stay at Hogwarts, said Hagrid fiercely. You've done wrong, and now you've got to pay for it. But this is servant stuff. It's not for students to do. I thought we'd be copying lines or something. If my father knew I was doing this, he'd... Tell you that's how it is at Hogwarts, Hagrid growled. Copying lines. What good's that to anyone? You'll do some of that. Something useful or you'll get out. If you think your father would rather you were expelled, then... Get back off to the castle and pack. Go on. Malfoy didn't move. He looked at Hagrid furiously but then dropped his gaze. Right then, said Hagrid. Now, listen carefully, because it's dangerous what we're going to do tonight, and I don't want no one taking risks. Follow me over here a moment. He led them to the very edge of the forest, holding his lamp up high. He pointed down a narrow, winding earth track that disappeared into the thick black trees. A light breeze lifted their hair as they looked into the forest. Look there, said Hagrid. See that stuff shining on the ground? Silvery stuff? That's unicorn blood. There's a unicorn in there, been hurt badly by Summit. This is the second time in a week. I found one dead last Wednesday. We're going to try and find the poor thing. We might have to put her out of its misery. And what if whatever hurt the unicorn finds us first? Said Malfoy, unable to keep the fear out of his voice. There's nothing that lives in the forest that'll hurt you if you're with me or Fang, said Hagrid. And keep to the path. Right now we're going to split into two parties and follow the trail off in different directions. There's blood all over the place. It must have been staggering around since last night at least. I want Fang, said Malfoy quickly, looking at Fang's long teeth. All right, but I warn you, he's a coward, said Hagrid. So me, Harry, and Hermione will go one way, and Draco, Neville, and Fang will go the other. Now, if any of us finds the unicorn, we'll send up green sparks, right? Get your wands out. Practice now. That's it. And if anyone gets in trouble, send up red sparks. We'll all come and find you, so be careful. Let's go. The forest was black and silent. A little way into it, they reached a fork in the path, and Harry, Hermione, and Hagrid took the left path, while Malfoy, Neville, and Fang took the right. They walked in silence, their eyes on the ground. Every now and then, a ray of moonlight through the branches above lit a spot of silver-blue blood on the fallen leaves. Harry saw that Hagrid looked very worried. Could a werewolf be killing the unicorns? Harry asked. Not fast enough, said Hagrid. It's not easy to catch a unicorn. They're powerful magic creatures. I never knew one to be hurt before. They walked past a mossy tree stump. Harry could hear running water. There must be a stream somewhere close by. There were still spots of unicorn blood here and there along the winding path. 
You all right, Hermione? Hagrid whispered. Don't worry. It couldn't have gone far if it's this badly hurt, and then we'll be able to... Get behind that tree! Hagrid seized Harry and Hermione and hoisted them off the path behind a towering oak. He pulled out an arrow and fitted it into his crossbow, raising it ready to fire. The three of them listened. Something was slithering over dead leaves nearby. It sounded like a cloak trailing along the ground. Hagrid was squinting up the dark path, but after a few seconds the sound faded away. I knew it, he murmured. There's something in here that shouldn't be. A werewolf? Harry suggested. There wasn't no werewolf, and it wasn't no unicorn either, said Hagrid grimly. Right. Follow me, but be careful now. They walked more slowly, ears straining for the faintest sound. Suddenly, in a clearing ahead, something definitely moved. Who's there? Hagrid called. Show yourself, I'm armed. And into the clearing came... Was it a man? Or a horse? To the waist, a man with red hair and a beard, but below that was a horse's gleaming chestnut body with a long, reddish tail. Harry and Hermione's jaws dropped. Oh, it's you, Ronan, said Hagrid in relief. How are you? He walked forward and shook the centaur's hand. Good evening to you, Hagrid, said Ronan. He had a deep, sorrowful voice. Were you going to shoot me? Can't be too careful, Ronan, said Hagrid, patting his crossbow. There's some bad loose in this forest. This is Harry Potter and Hermione Granger, by the way. Students up at the school. And this is Ronan. You two, he's a centaur. We'd noticed, said Hermione, faintly. Good evening, said Ronan. Students are you. And do you learn much up at the school? Um, a bit, said Hermione timidly. A bit. Well, that's something. Ronan sighed. He flung back his head and stared at the sky. Mars is bright tonight. Yeah, said Hagrid, glancing up too. Listen, I'm glad we've run into you, Ronan, because there's a unicorn been hurt. You seen anything? Ronan didn't answer immediately. He stared unblinkingly upward, then sighed again. Always the innocent are the first victims, he said. So it has been for ages past. So it is now. Yeah, said Hagrid. But have you seen anything, Ronan? Anything unusual? Mars is bright tonight, Ronan repeated while Hagrid watched him impatiently. Unusually bright. Yeah, but I was meaning anything unusual a bit nearer home, said Hagrid. So you haven't noticed anything strange? Yet again, Ronan took a while to answer. At last, he said... The forest hides many secrets. A movement in the trees behind Ronan made Hagrid raise his bow again, but it was only a second centaur, black-haired, embodied, and wilder-looking than Ronan. <laughs> Hello, Bane, said Hagrid. All right. Good evening, Hagrid. I hope you're well. Well enough. Look, I've just been asking Ronan, have you seen anything odd in here lately? There's a unicorn been injured. Would you know anything about it? Bane walked over to stand next to Ronan. He looked skyward. Mars is bright tonight, he said simply. We've heard, said Hagrid grumpily. Well, if either of you do see anything, let me know, won't you? We'll be off then. Harry and Hermione followed him out of the clearing, staring over their shoulders at Ronan and Bane until the trees blocked their view. Never! said Hagrid irritably. Try and get a straight answer out of a centaur. Ruddy stargazers. Not interested in anything closer than the moon. Are there many of them in here? asked Hermione. Oh, a fair few. Keep themselves to themselves mostly, but they're good enough about turning up if I ever want a word. They're deep, mind centaurs. They know things. Just don't let on much. Do you think it was a centaur we heard earlier? said Harry. Did that sound like hooves to you? Nah. If you ask me, that was what's been killing the unicorns. Never heard anything like it before. They walked on through the dense, dark trees. Harry kept looking nervously over his shoulder. He had the nasty feeling they were being watched. He was very glad they had Hagrid and his crossbow with them. They had just passed a bend in the path when Hermione grabbed Hagrid's arm. Hagrid, look! Red Sparks, the others are in trouble! You two wait here, Hagrid shouted. Stay on the path, I'll come back for you. 
They heard him crashing away through the undergrowth and stood looking at each other, very scared, until they couldn't hear anything but the rustling of leaves around them. You don't think they've been hurt, do you? whispered Hermione. I don't care if Malfoy has, but if something's got Neville, it's our fault he's in here in the first place. The minutes dragged by. Their ears seemed sharper than usual. Harry seemed to be picking up every sigh of the wind, every cracking twig. What's going on? Where were the others? At last, a great crunching noise announced Hagrid's return. Malfoy, Neville, and Fang were with him. Hagrid was fuming. Malfoy, it seemed, had sneaked up behind Neville and grabbed him as a joke. Neville had panicked and sent up the sparks. We'll be lucky to catch anything now with the racket you two were making. Right, we're changing groups. Neville, you stay with me and Hermione. Harry, you go with Fang and this idiot. I'm sorry, Hagrid added in a whisper to Harry. But he'll have a harder time frightening you, and we've got to get this done. So Harry set off into the heart of the forest with Malfoy and Fang. They walked for nearly half an hour, deeper and deeper into the forest, until the path became almost impossible to follow because the trees were so thick. Harry thought the blood seemed to be getting thicker. There were splashes on the roots of a tree, as though the poor creature had been thrashing around in pain close by. Harry could see a clearing ahead through the tangled branches of an ancient oak. Look! he murmured, holding out his arm to stop Malfoy. Something bright white was gleaming on the ground. They inched closer. It was the unicorn, all right, and it was dead. Harry had never seen anything so beautiful and sad. Its long, slender legs were struck out at odd angles where it had fallen, and its mane was spread pearly white on the dark leaves. Harry had taken one step toward it when a slithering sound made him freeze where he stood. A bush on the edge of the clearing quivered. Then, out of the shadows, a hooded figure came crawling across the ground like some stalking beast. Harry, Malfoy, and Fang stood transfixed. The cloaked figure reached the unicorn, lowered its head over the wound in the animal's side, and began to drink its blood. Ah! Malfoy let out a terrible scream and bolted. So did Fang. The hooded figure raised its head and looked right at Harry. Unicorn blood was dribbling down its front. It got to its feet and came swiftly toward Harry. He couldn't move for fear. Then a pain like he'd never felt before pierced his head. It was as though his scar were on fire. Half blinded, he staggered backward. He heard hooves behind him galloping, and something jumped clean over Harry, charging at the figure. The pain in Harry's head was so bad he fell to his knees. It took a minute or two to pass. When he looked up, the figure had gone. A centaur was standing over him, not Ronan or Bane. This one looked younger. He had white blonde hair and a palomino body. Are you all right? said the centaur, pulling Harry to his feet. Yes, thank you. What was that? The centaur didn't answer. He had astonishingly blue eyes like pale sapphires. He looked carefully at Harry his eyes lingering on the scar that stood out, livid, on Harry's forehead. "'You are the Potter boy,' he said. "'You'd better get back to Hagrid. The forest is not safe at this time, especially for you. Can you ride? It'll be quicker that way.' "'My name is Ferenzi,' he added, as he lowered himself onto his front legs so Harry could clam clamber onto his back. There was suddenly a sound of more galloping from the other side of the clearing. Ronan and Bane came bursting through the trees, their flanks heaving and sweaty. Forenzi! Bane thundered. What are you doing? You have a human on your back. Have you no shame? Are you a common mule? Do you realize who this is? said Forenzi. This is the Potter boy. The quicker he leaves this forest, the better. What have you been telling him? growled Bane. Remember, Ferenzi, we are sworn not to set ourselves against the heavens. Have we not read what is to come in the movements of the planets? Ronan pawed the ground nervously. I'm sure Ferenzi thought he was acting for the best, he said in his gloomy voice. Bane kicked his leg, back legs in anger. For the best! What is that to do with us? Centaurs are concerned with what has been foretold. 
It is not our business to run around like donkeys after stray humans in our forest. Ferenzi suddenly reared onto his hind legs in anger so that Harry had to grab his shoulders to stay on. Do you not see that unicorn? Ferenzi bellowed at Bane. Do you not understand why it was killed, or have the planets not let you in on that secret? I set myself against what is lurking in this forest, Bane. Yes, with humans alongside me if I must. And Ferenzi whisked around, with Harry clutching on as best he could. They plunged off into the trees, leaving Ronan and Bane behind them. Harry didn't have a clue what was going on. Why is Bane so angry? he asked. What was that thing you saved me from, anyway? Ferenzi slowed to a walk, warned Harry to keep his head bowed in case of low-hanging branches, but did not answer Harry's question. They made their way through the trees in silence for so long that Harry thought Ferenzi didn't want to talk to him anymore. They were passing through a particularly dense patch of trees, however, when Ferenzi suddenly stopped. Harry Potter, do you know what unicorn blood is used for? No, said Harry, startled by the odd question. We've only used the horn and uh, tail hair in potions. That's because it is a monstrous thing to slay a unicorn, said Ferenzi. Only one who has nothing to lose and everything to gain would commit such a crime. The blood of a unicorn will keep you alive, even if you are an inch from death, but at a terrible price. You've slain something pure and defenseless to save yourself, and you will have but a half-life, a cursed life, from the moment the blood touches your lips. Harry stared at the back of Ferenzi's head, which was dappled silver in the moonlight. But who'd be that desperate, he wondered aloud. If you're going to be cursed forever, death's better, isn't it? It is, Ferenzi agreed, unless all you need is to stay alive long enough to drink something else, something that will bring you back to full strength and power, something that will mean you can never die. Mr. Potter, do you know what is hidden in this school at this very moment? The Sorcerer's Stone, of course, the Elixir of Life, but I don't understand who... Can you think of nobody who has waited many years to return to power, who has clung to life, awaiting their chance? It was as though an iron fist had clenched suddenly around Harry's heart. Over the rustling of the trees, he seemed to hear once more what Hagrid had told him on the night they'd met. Some say he died. God Swallop, in my opinion, don't know if he had enough human left in him to die. Do you mean... Harry croaked. That was vol... Harry! Harry! Harry, are you all right? Hermione was running toward them down the path, Hagrid puffing along behind her. I'm fine, said Harry, hardly knowing what he was saying. The unicorn's dead, Hagrid. It's in that clearing back there. This is where I leave you, Ferenzi murmured as Hagrid hurried off to examine the unicorn. You're safe now. Harry slid off his back. Good luck, Harry Potter, said Ferenzi. The planets have been read wrongly before now, even by centaurs. I hope this is one of those times. He turned and cantered back into the depths of the forest, leaving Harry shivering behind him. Ron had fallen asleep in the dark common room, waiting for them to return. He shouted something about Quidditch fouls when Harry roughly shook him awake. In a matter of seconds, though, he was wide-eyed as Harry began to tell him and Hermione what had happened in the forest. Harry couldn't sit down. He paced up and down in front of the fire. He was still shaking. Snape wants the stone for Voldemort, and Voldemort's waiting in the forest, and all this time we thought Snape just wanted to get rich. Stop saying the name, said Ron in a terrified whisper, as if he thought Voldemort could hear them. Harry wasn't listening. Ferenzi saved me, but he shouldn't have done so. Bane was furious. He was talking about interfering with what the planets say is going to happen. They must show that Voldemort's coming back. Bane thinks Ferenzi should have let Voldemort kill me. I suppose that's written in the stars as well. Will you stop saying the name? Ron hissed. So all I've got to wait for now is Snape to steal the stone. Harry went on feverishly. Then Voldemort will be able to come and finish me off. Well, I suppose Bane will be happy. Hermione looked very frightened, but she had a word of comfort. Harry, everyone says Dumbledore's the only one you know who was ever afraid of. With Dumbledore around, you know who won't touch you. 
Anyway, who says the centaurs are right? It sounds like fortune-telling to me, and Professor McGonagall says that's a very imprecise branch of magic. The sky had turned light before they stopped talking. They went to bed, exhausted, their throats sore, but the night's surprises weren't over. When Harry pulled back his sheets, he found his, his invisibility cloak folded neatly underneath them. There was a note pinned to it. Just in case.